for me to an extent, and uh, yes, Jerry, we were just, we're good. All right. All right, and, and so a challenge that was brought before me was someone said, yeah, the, the passage that you read in Matthew is one thing, but what about the passage in Luke? So we're going to look at us really quick. In Luke chapter 19, we're going to begin with verse 11. Now they're going to use a word called a minor. And the mina is the equivalent of three months of wages. Okay, we remember that we learned earlier a denarius is a single day's wage. A mina is three months' wage. All right, so if you get a severance package of two minas, you're getting how many months of severance? Six. Six months. Okay. If you have vacation for one mina, how many vacation? You've got how many months? Three months. Okay. So we're going to take a look at these minus, not minus, but minus, M-I-N-A-S. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten, ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we do not want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for his servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten. <coughs> well done, my good and faithful servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master said, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your mind. I have kept it laid away in a handkerchief. I was afraid of you, because you are a hard man. You, you take out what you do not put in, and you reap what you do not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in, and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his mind away from him and give it to the one who has ten. Sir, they said, he already has ten. And he replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Jesus, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going to Jerusalem. Heavenly Father, we come before you again and we lift up your words. And while this is different from the passage we read earlier, we see that there are some similarities. But in either case, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us through your word, that we would be able to receive your grace, that you would help us to understand what it is you are here to speak to us about today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. A couple things that I'd like to bring to your attention in comparison. Jesus had just finished dealing with Zacchaeus. He was in the city of Jer uh, Jericho. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down because I'm going to your house for tea. For, for tea? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so that was the Sunday school song that I kind of just recited there. And this was a little man who was searching for Jesus. 
He's still in the city. Now we can see some parallels of what's going on as far as what is happening with this parable. Who's the person who goes off to be king? Who, who can we assume that is? Probably Jesus, right? Jesus was sent away to be king. His people said, we don't want this king. In fact, you remember that when Jesus was in front of Pilate, the crowd said, we have no king but Caesar. And so Jesus, who went away, put these stewards in charge. Now, in the one we read earlier, there were three servants he called, and they came back with a different amount. This one, there are ten, and they are each given one. Now, we have no idea what happened to the other seven. They could have been faithful. They could have been repugnant and selfish. They could have got two or five or seven. We don't know. When you tell a good story, usually the third one, that's the one that you got to pay attention to. So if you have a joke, there were three people in a boat, the first person did this, the second person did this, you know that the third person is going to do something. That's the story of what the joke is about. So Jesus gets to the point and he talks about this third person. When Jesus spoke in his parable, he's telling them, hey, you see Jerusalem, you know it, everybody's thinking the kingdom of God is coming. And he says, no, it's not going to happen like that. You're going to need to make sure that you pay attention. Because this guy went off for a while. He was going to be made king. And when he called his servants up and he gave these ten minus to them, he did not say, no, really quick, ten minus, that's ten, ten times three is thirty. This guy had thirty months worth of work tucked away. Wouldn't it be nice if you think of how much you made in a month? Now multiply that by thirty and put that in your bank account. Not just your bank account, but your savings account, which is your extra money. Now, this guy was doing well. And so, a little bit, yeah, almost three years. He was near Jerusalem, and this is where everyone thought the kingdom was going to happen. But when Jesus called the servants together, he did not say, Let's, let me have the great servant first, and then the good servant. Let me have the mediocre servant coming. He did not identify them as better or worse than one another. They were all servants. And he gave them each one. And even when we look back at the passage of Matthew, he still said, these servants, he gave five, two, and one. He did not say, let me give five to the great servant, two to the good servant, and one to the mediocre servant. And the servants who are bad servants, I don't even want to see. He didn't say that. He just gave to his servants. So when we are called to the kingdom of God, yes, he has given some of us talents in one area or another. But the message of God is given equally to all of us. We all get that message. We all have one Bible. One message. What we do with it reflects this. How many minds do we return? So Jesus has given us the single gospel. Forget about what your capacity is. Let's increase the capacity from five to five, two to two. Whatever. We're not after that. I'm not worried about the skill set you bring to the table. I'm worried about the fact that you're making sure you're coming to the table in the first place. That you are worthy to be called a servant of God. This is not just the pastor. In fact, I could easily go and sit down in the pew and God would then start calling names. It's not because I am the pastor that I'm a special servant. Yes, I have a special obligation and there's some things that I've got to make sure that I toe the line on, but we are all a priesthood of believers, as we see in the book of Hebrews. So with this Passover coming, and Jesus is getting ready to go, because it's the near the end. We know that the end is coming. And everyone's thinking it's coming now. Jesus said he goes away. And as we look at the, the time frame, 
None of us like to wait. You ever get someplace early and it hasn't opened? I made the mistake of not reading the sign, and I walk up and I'm knocking on the door to this establishment. And they kept pointing. What are you pointing at? I realized I'm pointing at the sign. I look at the sign. And on Tuesday, they open at 10. Monday, Wednesday through Friday, they open at 8. Why Tuesday? I don't know. Maybe they have a company meeting from 8 to 10. But I'm there before 10. And I'm trying to get in, but I can't get in because now I have to wait. Oh, I want to go somewhere else. I needed to go there, so that's just how it was. But sometimes we're put in a position where we're in the line of the lady with every other coupon but the one she's buying. So she's going through. I know I have it somewhere. Maybe it's in this one. Meanwhile, people are behind you. You have to make a decision. Do I change lanes? In fact, I know all of you who have gone, ever gone grocery shopping, you start looking and you think, all right, I could have been in that line. That person just got there. Am I going to get done first or are they going to get done first? It's a race. It's a race, exactly. And while you're waiting and they're going through, you think, oh, wrong lane. Was it Costco getting gas? And I'm, I'm waiting and waiting, and then one of the pumps shuts down. So now I'm in the lane, I got somebody behind me, I got cones blocking me off, and my, my thing has one pump working. Meanwhile, people who are showing up after me have two pumps working, so those lines are going through twice as fast, and I have to wait. But I'm paying the Costco prices for gas. So is it worth the wait? Well, this situation, I can't even get out of the line because everything's boxy and I'm stuck, so I'm going to have to wait. All of us are often put in situations where we have to wait. Some of you, perhaps, have come to a point where you want to get your driver's license. You have to wait till you're old enough. Some of you are looking forward to Halloween and you might be receiving candy, but you have to wait to get the free stuff. You can go to the store and buy it, but if you want the free stuff, you've got to wait. Some of you are looking forward to Christmas. And there are all these things that perhaps we want, but we need to wait for. The people wanted the kingdom of God to be present, but they needed to wait. The master distributes out these minas or minas, and he says, Go, be fruitful, basically. This one does not deal with the talents or the weights of silver, but rather it talks about the amount of wage that a person is to be faithful. Do business until I come. While the master was away receiving his kingdom, his servants were expected to do business, to use the resources that the master had equipped them with. He gave them, and to use them for the uttermost. Now some of us are only going to be able to get this. Many years ago, my dad came out, and the, the church board voted on this, and he called up like 14 elders, and he gave them each a $100 bill. And he spoke about this passage. He said, you're all getting the same amount, Go, do whatever you want with it, but I need you to bring 10% back to the Lord. It's amazing what people did. One guy was an umpire for a baseball league, so he bought himself new umpire gear. And then that entire set for his umpiring season, he gave 10% of that he brought more than $100 back to the church because of what he was faithful with. Other people did this and did that. And it was amazing how of these 14 people, the majority of them, like double-digit majority of them, all brought back more than $100 because they were faithful with what they were given. A couple of people didn't make it to the $100. They were trying to be faithful, but that's the best that their opportunities allowed them to. 
And we knew that as the risk, and the church board made that decision. That was fine. But the point was, here's something. Be faithful with what you are given. We are all given the same gospel. Now, we notice that the servants are serving. But there's a group of people in this land who are not servants. And they're like, no, 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 no. We do not want this guy as our king. You know what? We're going to go send a delegation and say, we don't want him. And as they go forth and they challenge and they want to do this, he's made king anyway. Some of you do not want certain of your elected representatives and officials to be those elected representatives. No, no, no. He's not my so-and-so. She's not my so-and-so. I voted for the other guy. Or other guy. That didn't make a difference. They're still voted in. And as much as we disagree here in America, I mean, we disagree. We do not have tanks rolling up on the Capitol, launching bombs, blowing up people, destroying entire communities so that they can make sure their person is in power. Now, we have people who get up and do crazy things sometimes. But we don't have these large factions like we see in other countries. Did you know right now, most of the people are talking about the armed conflict in both uh, Russia and Ukraine and in Gaza with Israel and the Palestinians. But there are 45 other armed conflicts going on in the world right now where there's a group of people with military arms trying to go ahead against another group of people. But they're not the big countries. Or it's been going on for so many years in various countries of Africa that nobody cares anymore. It's like a hundred year war almost. Some of you are familiar with some of the things that are going on in the country of yourself, in Mexico. Where there's the military, there's the government, there's the cartel, and there's the regular people. And these four groups of people are trying to exist. But many of them are in conflict. And people die in the middle. It's amazing how when people are away, like what's the phrase when uh, the cat's away and the mice will play? When the cat comes back and the mice are fat. Right, we, we went to a, a national park and there were these big signs about, I mean, they were anti fat chipmunks. They said, no fat chipmunks, the big signs and stuff like that. They said, fat chipmunks are a result of humans feeding them junk. You leave a chipmunk out to do its own thing, and it's not going to be obese. And when a rattlesnake comes for it, it can run. But when you got a fat one, because he's been eating all the candy and other stuff, and his body doesn't process it, the snake comes, the snake bites, and guess what? The snake sticks around. And you know what happens to the people who keep feeding them around? There is now a snake there. Whereas before, that snake was not being fed. So it looks for its food elsewhere. But when it's got a bunch of fatties to pick from, when a person gets in the way, we're in trouble. So just, just to keep in mind that these mice are getting fat. Cats coming back. So the king, he's made king, and he receives his kingdom, and then when he comes back, he calls for not his enemies, not his people, but his servants. Think about that for a moment. He calls the people who are serving him first. Now think about the rapture for a minute. Who is going to be called first? Those who are the believers. When God comes back in his throne, he is going to call the believers to himself first. We, as servants of God, are going to be called to Christ first. And then at that time, we will be judged on our actions. It's interesting if you look at the text, you'll see that he says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Because you were faithful in a little have authority over ten cities. Now, he is now the king. He has a new kingdom. 
And he has this steward who was faithful, and he said, you are going to be in charge of all ten of those. Because he now has these cities that he has to put people in charge of. He found somebody who was up to the task. Now, I, I'll tell you this. The best form of govern, government in the whole world is a monarchy. Because it is one person making decisions, and their decisions go. Today, we have people who are monarchs, and they make flawed decisions. But Jesus Christ comes not back as the elected president. He's not a prime minister, but he comes back as king. Because he is the monarchy, and what he says goes. But in this process, he has to trust that there are people who are able to handle his business. And so this wise king will put intelligent people around him. My hope is that I am never the smartest person in the room. If I've got people who are smarter than me, then if I've got to make a decision, I can listen to somebody. But if it's just on me, you know what's going to happen. We've all seen it. When it's up to you, many times you make a decision that did not go the way you wanted it to go. It looked good, it sounded good, but when it actually happened, no. Now we had game night here last Friday, and those of you who were here experienced something that you don't often see. The pastor flipped the table. I, I was on a team, and an individual did a move that I was I was just, oh. so I walked over, I cleared stuff up, I, I didn't just enrage the game. I went over to another table, I took the drinks off, and then I just picked the table up, like Jesus in the tent with the tables and the money changers. I just went, Pwah! flipped the table, because there was a person on my team, they had a decision to go right or left, and they went right. They had opportunity if they went to the left. They went to the right because they thought that was the better idea. Needless to say, our team did not win. Largely because of the individual's decisions that were being made. Like, oh, I'm here to help you. No, nope, I know that. So sometimes you have been put in that in your life. You know better. And the people you surround yourself with are not wiser. But rather they help bring you down. Or they may be wise, but you choose not to listen to them. So when Jesus came back, when the ruler came back to his kingdom, he appointed people who were smart enough to run those cities. I want you to think for a second about this guy named Jethro. Not the country guy with the last name Tob. Okay? But Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. Moses was getting overwhelmed. And Jethro told him, you need to appoint governors over these people. Some hundreds, some fifties, some tens. Because if everybody brings their complaints to you, you are going to not be able to lead these people. Wow. That's great insight. From an older guy. Remember, old people still have something to bring to the table. Moses, the follower of Jesus, or of God himself. And here he is, he's got the Ten Commandments, and he's right there. And still, this person who's older and wiser gives him a recommendation. He says, oh, good idea. And so he established judges over the people. And the people did not overburden Moses. So here we have this man who's put in charge of ten. We have another man who's put in charge of five. But, if you'll notice, he is not rewarded with the words, well done, good and faithful servant. The guy who got ten got an attaboy. You get ten. The guy who got five, he got five, but he didn't get the attaboy. Perhaps he could have done better. God was happy with his progress, and he did what he was supposed to do, but he, he didn't get the good work. Some of you are going to do a good thing in life, and you are not going to get the value back. Does that make you less valuable? No. Does that mean it? Basically, you did something good, but maybe somebody overshadowed you. I don't know, but you did not get the value back. We do not see that this servant said, forget you. You didn't say, good boy, I'm out of here. Some of you may have worked for a boss 
that refuses to compliment you. And if this boss doesn't compliment you, then you decide to leave because I'm not appreciated. If you get your paycheck, you're appreciated. But this sir, third servant, surly guy, comes in with a dirty rag, a handkerchief, and he says, here you go. Now, be mindful. This king put servants in charge of this stuff. And as he did so, these servants were doing things on behalf of the king. The king got to reap the reward, and yet he didn't do it. He put people in charge. So he harvested where he did not sow. He took where he did not plant. It's not going into other people's houses and stealing it, but rather he put them in charge of things, and then he stepped back. And then when they did what they were supposed to do, they were rewarded. But he held the man who did this to a higher standard. Now I want you to notice something though. In the book of Matthew, he was tossed out. Worthless and lazy is what he was called. Get out of here. But this guy, he is not kicked out of service. This guy, what he has has been taken from him but he is still the man's servant. He is not, in one verse later, treated like the enemy. Those who refused to serve were brought forth and wiped away. We don't like the idea of justice. We like the idea of fairness with privileges. Okay? Justice means you get what you deserve. And many of you deserve some things that... Mm -hmm. But rather, we want equality, but if I do something right, I get some extras. So a lot of people are trying to say, if we're good enough, we get into heaven. But God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. And that's true. God does not want anyone to leave him. But... He has to create some standards, and if these standards aren't met, it doesn't happen. There are people today who have driver's license from Legoland, from Disneyland, from a cereal box, and they're out driving their cars. Mm -hmm. They did not do what was expected. Now, they get in an accident or something happens, and we look at the enemy to get their license, that's not fair. They get an accident, even what they have is taken from them. They can't get privileges, they go to jail, there's all sorts of stuff, they manslaughter. I mean, I don't wish this on anyone. But there's a reason why there are these tests that are put out by the DMV. Do you know how to do what you're supposed to be doing? And when you get behind the wheel, where you with an experienced driver who helped teach you and coach you and guide you. So when you sat in there, you followed through. Now for me, I'm a fan of the overhaul of the driving test. I think there should be a screaming baby and a hot cup of coffee and something on the floor. And you've got to drive to your destination. Your phone, I mean. <laughs> and, and you've got to have this Crying in the back because most of you, you know what you do when you're driving? It's okay. It's okay. If you can't do that, you shouldn't be on the road. If you're trying to drink your coffee, oh, it's not. It's spilled. How many of you have been driving and something fell or spilled? Reaching down below and trying to drive at the same time. None of you pull over or handle the situation. But I mean, that's what people do. I remember there was a movie where a guy took his coffee cup, he set it up on the top, and he said, if you spill it, you fail. Go. It's amazing today, okay, I'm going to pass this test, but then I'm going to drive like nothing is there. And so this servant was still able to serve the master, but he was not able to be in charge of the cities. He was not able to be living up to the potential that the others have. And Jesus emphasized this. He says, For I say to you, 
that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Now some people talk this about perhaps a reward in heaven. But if we go back to Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Whoever is faithful in the Lord will be rewarded. And whoever is not suffers loss. In the Christian life, we are not supposed to stand still and be stationary and sedentary. But we are to use our gifts and make progress. Or else we will lose what we have. The main point of this parable is that the kingdom will be delayed. Remember, they're all in Jericho, a short distance from Jerusalem. They're about to march on the capital, and they're about to take over, and Jesus is going to be king. No, it's going to be delayed. And now, you must concentrate on being a faithful servant in the meantime. While you wait, what do you do? Our master has gone away to a far country and will one day return to his kingdom. In the meantime, we are commanded to do business with that and those whom he has left behind until he return. What are you doing with what God has given you? Natural talents and abilities. What is the capacity you have to grow? But also, what are you doing with the gospel that has been presented before you? You have your skills and abilities, and that will grow the gospel message. We're not after increasing your skills and abilities. We are after you to increase the gospel. Because when God is present, addition is absent. It goes to multiplication. God multiplied their numbers. When Jesus had the loaves and fish, he multiplied. Go forth and multiply. He is not saying go forth and add. And a few were added. When Jesus was present, it multiplies. And as we look at our own lives, is the gifts and the power of God multiplying? Is it added? Or is it being shoved in the bag? And we'll present it later and can mile. Unless you're like me and can't remember where you write things. Somewhere in my house is a hundred dollar bill. I put it where no one was going to go in case the thief broke in. But I can't remember where I put it. Whenever I move, peel the walls down, I don't know. There might be a hundred dollar bill floating somewhere. It's somewhere. Don't be like me. Don't hide yourself. Use what you have. When the judgment day will come to the enemy. God will handle that. But focus on you and your faithfulness and how you can help others become servants and how that those servants can also be faithful and love. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you for what you have given us. We thank you for the mind that you have entrusted us with your word. Lord, regardless of what the world may try to deny your deity, we know that you reign as the master. And regardless of what they say, you will come back and show us what is right. Lord, we come again and we say, please, fill us with your Spirit so that we might be able to multiply the things in which you have given us. And may we be able to be faithful, not just adequate, but may we receive the good and faithful servants who have been faithful with a few things. Now you will be in charge of many. May that be said to each person who is here today listening to us online. May we be at peace with you. May we be diligent with what we have. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.